The black church was always the home to the black community. The black church was the place where we got a lot of things done. We have like the first congressional black meetings there. Whenever something uh, bad happened in the communities, if there was a lynching or there was uh, some type of mis uh, police misconduct, the civil rights movement, all these things came out of the black church. The black church was was the place where we met, where, where we met as black people and we got things done. But there was also a dark side to the black church. There was a lot of uh, 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 essay assaults going on back in the day. There was a lot of women uh, sleeping with the pastor. There was a lot of deacons sleeping with uh, church members and stuff like that. So you had a good side to the church that helped, that helped advance us and move us forward. But then you had a dark side to the church. And in speaking about this dark side... I want to talk about this woman, Tarika James, from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, this woman is no longer with her because she unalived herself of about two weeks ago. She was suffering from uh, deep-seated depression. She had a whole bunch of stuff going on, but she allegedly had an affair 22 years ago with the, fir uh, uh, the first lady, the pastor's wife. Uh, and this, this, lady, this lady went by the name of uh, Sonia Spence Walker. And they was having an affair... But she was 18 years old when they was having the affair. And she, 22 years later, she was still depressed about it. She started to uh, write, uh, 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 post stuff on social media about it to tell her story. And it went something like this. Hi. For those who do not know me, my name is Eternity. And this is an introduction to um, my playlist the True Confessions of a Teenage Mistress. So when I was 18, I was in a sexual affair with a church leader um, of my home church. And this, this playlist, this collection of, of videos is to talk about that experience and to share my story because I am at an age now, uh, 40 to be exact, that I realize the abusive and exploitative nature of that relationship. Now, many will say, oh, well, 18 is an adult, you can make your own decisions. And to a degree, I agree with that. But that's also um, a mindset that allows predators to take advantage of people, waiting for them to be legal. Um, because even with the uh, legalness of being 18, there's still the context of how that situation began. Um, which is what I'll be going into. Uh, the reason I'm talking about this is because I've carried this for um, 22 years. And the majority of that time, it was not until I turned about 38 that I, that I actually came into some higher truths about the situation. But up until that point, I had always taken responsibility and blamed myself for, for being in that situation. And now I am at a point where I see it for what it was. I um, see just how I was manipulated and, and used by somebody who I loved deeply and intimately. intimately. So she's telling the details about her intimate relationship with this first lady uh, in North Carolina. Now, this woman was 18 years old, and she's saying that um, she know that uh, she knows that she was 18, and she blamed herself for so long to, to she was for 20 years she blamed herself, and then somewhere around 30 at 38 years old she had an epiphany and started blaming the pastor, and because she, she was saying that there was things that led up to that. Now I'm torn between this, right? And I'll I'll give my insight on why. I'm torn between this, but I want y'all to listen to this other part of what she was saying about this first lady. Check this out. I'm back because I thought of a couple of other things that I had forgotten about in terms of the uh, hanky-panky 
uh, so there was a time where we had gone to the movies and I don't know what we went to see. I don't think it matters because um, I was in the theater <laughs> and I thought we were discreet, but at one point it seemed like um, one of the uh, attendants was coming in and walking up to where we were. So I was like, oh, maybe they see us through the, the, uh, the back window <laughs> where the film is coming out of. I was like, oh, no. So uh, I stopped. <laughs> There was another time we were in her car. She used to have um, a Ford Explorer she called the Grey Ghost. And I don't know, we were just driving and like we were just sitting on the side of a road. And again, I was doing her. Um, and then a car pulled up behind us and it looked like a police car. And so uh, I was kind of like, we should probably drive off. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> Oh man, I remember those two very, very clearly. So now let's get to Sonia Spence Walker. Sonia Spence Walker, like I said, she was a first lady. She's no longer married to that man no more. She got a divorce and got remarried. And now she's uh, the head pastor of her own church. Um, we dug up, we did some digging, and we found one of her sermons at the World Center, her World Center church or whatever. And she was on, uh, you know, <laughs> up there propagating the word of God and teaching and preaching and doing all these things where she had all these alleged uh, 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 accusations being uh, levied against her. But let's listen to what she, uh, what she was preaching from the pool pit. This day and time suffering seems to be a commonality um, that seems to be relative to the people of God. If you talk to different people in different churches and reformations and things, everybody seems to be going through something. Amen. Some type of suffering. Amen. Everybody seems to be going through a personal trial or a tribulation. They're facing afflictions. Some people are sick. Amen. And we often know that sometimes it would be nice if we were able to dictate our own suffering. Amen. We could dictate the type of suffering of Deaconess Barbara. Amen. With who? Whom we're going to suffer with and for how long we're going to suffer. You, It would be wonderful if you could tell God how long you wanted to go through whatever you're going through. It, it, wouldn't it be nice hey, if you would give God a time limit? Say, okay, Jesus, I need you to let me go through this for 24 hours, but after then, I need it to be over with. Would, wouldn't it be nice to be able to tell him what to do? Hallelujah. But that's not the way it's designed. Amen. Hallelujah. We have to understand that if we did it that way, it would be an individualized preference. It really wouldn't be suffering. We would just be preferred to do A, B, and C. So she made, she had this sermon of, of preaching about suffering and long suffering and things when you're going through how to call on God. Um, you know all these different things and it, to me was she talking was she talking about Tarika and Tarika herself she she made a whole like playlist of this woman Sonia now to me Tarika wasn't working with a full deck like she wasn't right I mean it was over 20 something years that uh, the Sonia the preacher moved on with her life got a divorce got remarried started her own church went on with her life this woman was still holding on to uh, these things to the point where she broke down on a live one time and before she uh, unalived herself and she said this because I always heard the song like on the radio or something you know they always cut off the the trail in and it wasn't until recently that I heard that last line that fade out don't nobody know and that hits on so many levels because at least early on, nobody knew we were together. You know, I know that happened later. And one thing that I think no no amount of video journaling or written journaling or talking about it, I cannot express how deeply I love this woman. And Sweet Love hits me hard because, number one, it's just an intense, passionate song. But again, that's the one she picked for me. And my nickname that she gave me was Sweetness. 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 So she left Raleigh, North Carolina and moved to Greensboro. And she was under um, so much distress. So she finally told her mom after 20 years about what happened. 
it, it's this, this this story is is kind of exhausting but i'm really going to get to the i'm going to get to the gist of it um she came back online and she spoke and said this far more recent this was actually last week so um i went to to Raleigh to visit my mom um she hurt herself recently so i was, I was going to, to, to check on her and driving to raleigh getting into raleigh i started feeling anxiety i started feeling trapped because i hadn't been i hadn't been back home since i had told my mom about what happened and that was back in in october i don't think i had been back to raleigh since then so this was my first time going back and it was extremely extremely hard to handle um being there and and feeling like i was that much closer to her was excruciating and i knew it was all in my mind because as far as i know she might not even be in town she might be traveling somewhere i don't know where she at i don't i don't know that and i've had an experience one time before where i was at some i was at somebody's house and um a person who is who has caused a lot of trauma for me um, separate from this i thought she was there and i was tripping like the whole time and come to find out the person i thought it was wasn't even her so I knew it was in my head. So I remembered that time. And I'm like, it's, it's in my head. You, you're not going to run into her. You're not going to see her. It's in your head. But it doesn't matter that it's in your head because your body reacts to to it as being real. And so um, I, I park. I go in the building. I go see my mom, spend time with her. As soon as I walk out of that room, it all comes flooding back, That 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 feeling of of anxiety and, and trappedness and and I had to admit to myself I said I, I'm afraid of her and I'm not afraid of her as a person I'm afraid of the power she still has over me because I know at some point I'm going to see her again for whatever reason either I just run into her on the street or heaven forbid there's a another um, member funeral where like all of the old church people are together for whatever reason i know i'm going to see her again and i don't know how i'm going to handle that i don't know how i'm going to be able to process that i don't know if i'm going to have the strength to completely ignore her i don't know if um i'm going to collapse under my own emotions and just turn into like a little child again i, I have no idea now this is all very sad but uh, on September on September the seventh, September the eighth, she makes this post. July twenty fifth, nineteen eighty three, to September seventh, two thousand twenty four. I did the best I could with what I had. I'm sorry it wasn't enough, but now I don't have to live for anyone else anymore. I can finally, I can, I, I can finally for me. So this was she. She committed suicide. She went on ahead and took her life. And I told y'all that she was dealing with things outside of just this situation with this former uh, uh, first lady, uh, Sonia. There's some other deep-seated things that was going on with this woman. Now, her brother went on, uh, Brian M. L. James said, my sister spoke her truth and the church turned their back. All Tarika James wanted was the love and support from the first lady she knew as a child. I could say so much, but I know God's word is final. Thank you to North Carolina Beat for reaching out and supporting our family throughout this traumatic and heartbreaking experience. We love you. We love you, Tori. Then somebody said, uh, D, D Blackman said, hell no, I know this pastor. Uh, I've been knowing her for over 40 years. She couldn't possibly have done this, right? Then uh, uh, Kenisa Williams said, D Blackman, I'm shocked. We all attended the same church. Uh, if you've known me uh, as, as long as they have. Man, you know, and then another person said, Desi, Desi Moore said, um, y'all that are talking, y'all that are talking about uh, they were 18 as irritating as, as F. That's still a child. No, it's not. And she had she had known them all her life. Um, at the very least, she sat and waited until they were of, of legal age to initiate and intimidate and uh, intimidate a relationship with them. She's a predator, and this is absolutely disgusting and heartbreaking. Uh, may, the, uh, may her soul finally rest in peace, right? 
So then her mother, her mother came on there and said, um, it is with a heavy heart and pain that I announced my oldest child, Tori Eternity uh, Phillips, transitioned from that, uh, this life today. Please keep me and my family in prayer as we process our grief and pain. You know, and I'm going to say this, you know, I'm going to say this about this. Um, I, I would like to know her, uh, their, uh, her, her background as a child. Um, was she, uh, was, was her innocence interrupted when she was a child? Um, at 18 years old, you're old enough to know right from wrong, whether, whether somebody's grooming you or not. You know what I mean? At 18, had this girl had it been like 10 or 11 or 12, 13 years old. And, you know, we found out that this pastor did this. Now this pastor is, is uh, what she did wasn't illegal, but it was wrong. It was wrong. It was morally wrong to be a, a, a person of the church, propagating and teaching the word of God. It's it's just wrong all the way around, all the way off the board. But when I'm with with this woman at 18 years old, she knowingly and willingly went into something with this woman when she understood right from wrong, and she dealt with it psychologically for years. But there's other underlying issues here, and you can see it play out. She had, I mean, it's been, it was 22 years later, this woman went on with her life, moved on, and, and just forgot about her and went on with her life. She didn't forget about it. <clears throat> and to me, for me, that's not because of that act. There's other things that, 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 that's formulating in her mind as to why she would even do that. She knew that this woman was married. If she grew up in the church and she knew her, she knew that she was married. She knew that she also knew that it was wrong. Or, or, or was her innocence taken at a very young age where she's not operating from uh, uh, a normal way of thinking because she is, she's already had interruption as a child. So for me, like if she was, if she was 12 or a young child, I would understand that. But the, the decisions that she made, she had other issues going on, man. And it, it, it's, it's clear as day. Um, we don't have no proof, no definitive proof. We have her word, but we don't have no definitive proof either that um, it actually happened at all. So, but what we do know is she unalived herself and she was online, you know, talking about uh, this situation. And it's just, I had this conversation with my wife. I asked my wife about this and asked her what her opinion was, you know, and like, and like I said, I said, for me, I struggled with it because she was 18 years old. She was at an age where she can uh, make decisions on her on her own and understand the decisions that she was making, you know. Uh, but also the pastor, the pastor is dead wrong, dead wrong, because she could have been she could have been grooming them and doing all those things, uh, but at, uh, grooming them and bringing them along or bringing or bringing along a bunch of people to find out who would bite the bait. That's that's she that's for sure, and we know that we know that that demon is in the church. We know that that demon is in the church. That demon persists, persists all throughout the church, man. And that's why that's why um, I left a lot of these churches alone. Because we know that it's there and, it, 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 and, and nobody wants to really talk about it. Nobody wants to really deal with it. So this woman moved on and got another church. So I hope, I, uh, it's because I hope that she's not doing this to nobody else. But like I said... Um, Tarika had other, to me, Tarika had other issues going on outside of this. And when, uh, this didn't go her way or, um, uh, the first lady didn't give her the attention and the love that she wanted, you got all of this. She kind of lost it because she was already gone from the start. That's the way I see it. But I'm gonna cut this video short here, man. Leave your comments in the comment section. Let me know what you guys think. Subscribe to Street Media TV. Hit that like button. And remember, I love y'all till the next time. Peace.